Hello, health warriors, and welcome to episode 115 of Eat, Drink, Live Longer. I'm your host, registered dietitian, Liz Weiss. Today's show comes to you from my longevity kitchen, and our featured ingredient is one of my favorite foods in the world, dark chocolate. You thought I was going to say avocados. No, it's dark chocolate. You know, I once heard someone say that nine out of 10 people love chocolate and that the 10th person is lying. And I think that's true. Chocolate is universally adored the world over. In fact, it is the world's favorite sweet treat. It is a beloved food and it is part of my DNA, especially dark chocolate. Chocolate comes from cacao, which comes from the seeds of these football-shaped pods that grow on the cacao tree. So yes, there is such a thing as a chocolate forest. I've never been in one, but I want to go to a chocolate forest. And when I was a kid, I will say that Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was probably one of my absolute most beloved movies. I could still watch it over and over again. The original movie, of course. So cacao, it is complex. It's high in levels of minerals like magnesium and antioxidants like flavanols. Now, unlike commercial milk chocolate, which contains cocoa butter and sugar and milk and small quantities of cacao, dark chocolate has higher amounts of cacao and less sugar than milk chocolate. So if you're going to reap the health benefits from cacao, it's the dark chocolate that you're going to want to look for. Let me tell you just a little bit about the health benefits of dark chocolate, and we'll get more into it later in the show. But basically, dark chocolate contains phytonutrients called flavonoids, which are plant compounds that act as antioxidants, and they may play a role in cancer prevention and heart health. The cacao plant that chocolate is derived from, it also contains compound, a compound called theobromine, and that may help to reduce inflammation and potentially uh, lower blood pressure. I will be doing a show on inflammation. That's an important topic that we definitely want to dig deeper into when it comes to longevity. But yeah, so, so many health benefits. It's got these you know, antioxidants, actually more than green tea or red wine. And the darker you go, the more antioxidants you get. But of course, you know, there needs to be a balance. People might say, oh, I'm going to eat the darkest chocolate I can, but it, gosh, it doesn't taste good. It's got to taste good, right? So how dark should that chocolate be? Well, get a pen and paper out. This is important. Your best bet is to choose a bar with 70% cacao or higher. Bars with lower percentages are going to have more added sugar and more unhealthy fats. So the, you know, the 70% is really like your magic number, but really like any sweet, because you know, chocolates, that's a sweet, it's a sweet treat. We don't want to go too crazy with it, right? So keeping the portion down is really important. So how much should you eat? Well, a lot of the research has been done on about an ounce a day. Ah, my air conditioner went off. So if the audio changed, you guys, it's because the AC went off. Thank you very much. I'm actually in Florida when I'm recording this show. I'm in my hotel room. This is the beauty of podcasting. I can do it anywhere. And of course, I couldn't figure out how to turn off the AC, but it just went off. Oh, it sounds so much better. Anyway one ounce of dark chocolate. Now, if you get a candy bar and it's got like 70% cacao or higher and you eat the whole thing and then you look and you're like, oh my gosh, that was three and a half ounces. You know, maybe mm, have it a little bit one day, a little bit the next, a little bit the next. So that sweet treat is just that. It's a small treat, but it's got those health benefits. So the dark chocolate, yes, the research has been done on the dark chocolate, not the milk chocolate. And I will say to another caveat that if you're consuming the SAD diet, that's the standard American diet, it's high in refined carbs and saturated fat. It's low in the protective fruits and veggies and beans and the whole grains that we want to be eating more of. If you're just piling on the chocolate on top of the SAD diet, you're probably not going to reap the health benefits. But if you consume a healthy plant forward diet, which is something we want to do for longevity, adding a little bit of dark chocolate can help you achieve your health goals because you're adding that plant food, that nourishing plant food into your diet. So anyway, what's in store today? Well, we're going to give you a, a brief history, we, me, brief history of chocolate. 
I'm going to talk about the difference between dark chocolate, milk chocolate, and white chocolate. And then I'm going to give you recipes because that's what I always love to do. I just created a recipe for you for dark chocolate pecan and dried cherry clusters. They're crunchy. They're yummy. I adore them. And they're so easy to make. So I created that just for this episode. I also put together a recipe roundup of nearly 40 dark chocolate recipes from fellow dietitians who are also bloggers like me. And so I'll put a link, of course, to the recipe roundup in the show notes. Um, But on the show, I'll tell you a little bit about a dark chocolate mousse, a dark chocolate and banana bread, and uh, dark chocolate turtles. Yummy. So all rich in dark chocolate, but moderate in added sugar and saturated fat. So slightly better for you, sweet dark chocolate treats. We'll get into that on the show. And as always, if you love the show, tell a friend about it, post a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts, head to lizishealthytable.com slash podcast for the show notes to eat, drink, live longer, episode 115, lots of links in store for you there. So we know, we know that chocolate is adored all over the world. Mostly the Europeans and the people in the U.S. seem to really love their chocolate. They consume more than 3 million tons of cocoa beans a year, according to the World Cocoa Foundation. But where did chocolate derive from, right? We're going to talk a little bit about that. And um, oh, before I tell you where it derives from, the history, I do want to say that not all dark chocolate is used in sweet treats and drinks like, you know, hot chocolate. Surprisingly, chocolate is also found in some savory dishes. And I'm going to give you a link to a few recipes I found online that looked really interesting. But in Mexico, have you ever had mole sauce, mole poblano? That is a sauce that contains over a dozen ingredients. It's a complex sauce, including chili peppers and cocoa. Um, I've had it served over chicken. Very interesting. I've seen recipes for hearty chili, like bean chilies or beef chilies made with cocoa powder and chili peppers kind of round out and balance one another. So I'm going to give you a link to a recipe that I found that I have got to try to make. I'm going to make it for a triple chocolate beef and bean chili. Hello. Let me say that again. Triple chocolate beef and bean chili. That sounds so good. And I just ran across another recipe for savory. What is it? Oh, eggplant caponata. Yes. A classic Italian dish sweetened with caramelized onions and raisins and rounded out with grated unsweetened chocolate. Hello, I am absolutely going to try that recipe. Okay, history. Let's do a little, a little, let's step back in time. Let's see, 4,000 years to ancient Mesoamerica, present day Mexico. That is where the first cacao plants were found. The Olmec, one of the earliest civilizations in Latin America, they were the first to turn the cacao plant into chocolate. Thank you very much for that. They drank their chocolate during rituals. They used it as medicine. So this has been going on a long time that this plant food with its medicinal or health properties has been used by peoples who, you know, were living off the land and using plants as medicine. Now, centuries later, the Mayans, they praised chocolate as the drink of the gods. I could not agree more. They uh, revered a brew made out of roasted and ground cacao seeds mixed with chilies, water, and cornmeal. By the 15th century, the Aztecs were using cacao beans as currency, as money. They believed that chocolate was also a gift from the gods. This is a common thread. And they drank it as a refreshing beverage, an aphrodisiac. They, They used it to prepare for war. So it really was a food fit for warriors, for health warriors. And it's believed that chocolate made its way to Spain in the mid 1500s, became very popular among the wealthy. You know, it took a long time to take these cacao beans and ferment them and dry them and grind them and separate them and utilize them in various beverages and and treats. And so it was a, a arduous process. It took time, it took money. So yeah, it was the aristocracy it was the royals. They were the ones who were eating the chocolate. And it was in 1828, with the invention of the chocolate press, that it revolutionized chocolate making and it made it available to the masses. 
Now, chocolate making is very complex. I'm not going to get into it on the podcast because we'd be here all day, people. But in the show notes, this is important. I'm going to post a video that I watched on YouTube, which explains this whole chocolate making process. I think it's like a seven minute video. It is so fascinating, you guys. So I encourage all of you to check it out. Okay. All right. Let's get a little bit more into the health benefits of chocolate. I'm going to then give you some recipes. And then let's talk about the difference between dark chocolate and milk chocolate and bittersweet because it can get very complicated. And in doing the research for this show, I learned a lot and it's really changing the way I shop for chocolate now. Okay. So besides the flavanols that I talked about, which are these antioxidants uh, that protect our bodies from oxidative stress. And by the way, oxidative stress from everyday life, from pollution, from the sun, just from aging. We want antioxidants. We want to eat foods that stop oxidation. Oxidation is bad for our DNA. It breaks it down. This is why we age. And so eating these flavanols in chocolate and dark chocolate, that helps our bodies to have less stress, essentially, to age backwards, if you will. But besides the flavanols, chocolate contains a lot of nutrients. Now, if you look at a hundred grams of chocolate, that's a three and a half ounce bar of the 70 to 85% cacao. So that higher percentage, listen to all the nutrients you get. Now I'm not saying you should eat that three and a half ounce bar. We talked about the one ounce serving, but in three and a half ounces, you're going to get 67% of the daily requirement for iron, 11 grams of fiber. Hello, 58% of your daily requirement for magnesium. Now, magnesium is responsible for hundreds of chemical reactions in the body. It actually may boost exercise performance, and it may also support heart health. So lots of good reasons to get magnesium. 89% of copper. Now, copper together with iron, it enables the body to form red blood cells. It maintains healthy bones and blood vessels and nerves and a healthy immune system. So copper and then manganese, almost all of the manganese you need in a day. So you're like manganese, what the heck does that do? Well, manganese helps the body form connective tissue. It's important for bone health and for blood clotting. And then there's other minerals in chocolate, potassium, phosphorus, zinc, and selenium. Zinc and selenium, by the way, very important for a healthy immune system. Dark chocolate may help prevent heart disease. It may help to lower the risk of stroke. And research suggests that it's the flavanols in dark chocolate that maintain heart health. Interestingly, these chemicals, these flavanols help to produce nitric oxide. That doesn't sound good, but nitric oxide is good because it causes our blood vessels to relax and our blood pressure to go down, lower blood pressure. So nitric oxide relaxing those blood vessels. Oh, the antioxidants in dark chocolate may help to raise the good HDL cholesterol in our bodies and lower the bad LDL cholesterol. Dark chocolate may improve cognition. It may prevent memory loss and boost mood. No surprise there. And it may improve blood sugar levels and reduce the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. But again, remember we talked about like not going too crazy with the amount of chocolate we're consuming, that ounce of dark chocolate being kind of the magic, the magic number. The American Cancer Society recommends eating foods rich in antioxidants. Dark chocolate is one of them. Again, protecting, helping to protect our cells from the damage of oxidation. So keeping us younger, helping to reverse the aging process. I love that. Oh, and chocolate also may be good for gut health. That's also kind of interesting, right? So yeah, good for the gut. And we know that the bacteria that live in our gut eat uh, fiber. They like plant foods. So a little bit of chocolate, good for the microbiome. And also past research also found that during digestion, chocolate behaves like a prebiotic, right? Like I said, that it's the food that feeds the bacteria, right? So the bottom line here is the more plants we add to our diet, the better. All right. This leads me to my new recipe for 
chocolate, pecan, and dried cherry clusters. I'm going to call them crunchies. That's I like that word crunchies better. They're crunchy clusters. So dark chocolate, pecan, and dried cherry crunchy clusters. How's that? So here's what you're going to need for this recipe. One cup of dark chocolate chips. You guessed it, 70% cacao or higher. And you're going to need about five ounces. So the one cup, I measured it out, weighed it out, five ounces. You'll need two cups of flaked cereal. So like a corn flakes or any whole grain kind of flaky cereal, but think corn flakes. A quarter cup of chopped pecans and then a quarter cup of dried unsweetened tart cherries. You could use raisins. You could use dried cranberries. You could chop up some dried apricots would be really nice. You could add some chopped up dates, but you know where I'm going with this, right? Dried fruit. So what I like to do is I like to put the chocolate chips in a microwave safe bowl, and then I heat it in the microwave in like 30 second increments and then stir in between until the chocolate is melted. So you do that, maybe it'll be a total of, I don't know, two minutes or so, maybe a little longer. It depends how strong your, your microwave is. But once the chocolate is melted, mix in the flaked cereal. Once that's coated with the chocolate, add the pecan and add the tart cherries. And then you can take a baking sheet. You can spray it lightly with nonstick cooking spray, or you can put some parchment paper on it. And you then take two spoons and you just kind of scoop out the this crunchy mixture. I call them blobs. And you just place the blobs on the baking sheet. And then you kind of just form them. I say two spoons because you can use them to kind of just smush the contents together. And you're going to be like, "Eh, it looks like it's not going to stick together. But trust me, if they're all kind of touching, you know, each, each blob is kind of connected. Once they get popped in the fridge and they chill for 30 minutes, the chocolate will harden and you'll have these maybe two inch round little blobby things, the little clusters, and they're so good. Now I, I say this yields eight to 10 but you can make them a lot smaller if you're really into the whole portion control, or you can make them a little bit bigger. But remember five ounces of chocolate, we're going to get about 10 of these little crunchies. So that's a half an ounce of the dark chocolate per cluster. So super yummy, super, super simple recipe. Now there's a few other recipes in this recipe roundup that I must tell you about because they're so, so good. And the first comes from uh, Laura Ali. She's a dietitian. She's a friend. And she has a recipe on her website for dark chocolate orange mousse. Oh, how good does that sound? And she basically makes it with um, three and a half ounces of dark chocolate. I say use the chocolate chips. She's chopping it up and that's fine. That could be like a three and a half ounce dark chocolate bar, right? 70% or higher. And, um, but the chips melt really quickly, which is why I like to use them. She's using silken tofu in this recipe, orange zest, a little bit of agave syrup. You could use maple syrup, uh, but agave she's using, a little bit of kosher salt. And then she's adding some, uh, a tablespoon of Cointreau or uh, any other orange flavored liqueur. And then she's taking strawberries and smashing them up, about a half a cup of sliced strawberries with a little bit more Cointreau and some orange zest. But basically she's melting the chocolate. She's using hers in a double boiler. She's using, I just go the microwave method. She's then whipping the tofu in a food processor. She's adding the zest and the agave, Cointreau, and then she's adding that dark chocolate. And then she divides the mixture between four glasses or ramekins and she refrigerates for three hours or overnight. And then she tops it with those strawberries. Delish. I love this idea. I think something that would be really fun for this recipe too would be in the bottom of the ramekins, crunching up maybe some graham crackers or something, or making making like a little crust with a mixture of nuts and graham crackers, a little bit of maybe uh, butter, melted butter, or even olive oil, and make some little crust below and then add the boost to it. Oh, so good. I love that. Love that recipe. There's another recipe. So thank you, Laura Ali. Again, I'll put a link in the show notes. This is another recipe in the roundup from Jackie Nugent, another dietitian who's also a chef. And she has a recipe on her website for this 
double chocolate banana bread. And she's using pastry flour, a whole wheat pastry flour. So you get a little extra fiber there. Unsweetened cocoa powder. Um, She's got baking powder and baking soda. She's adding four fully ripened bananas that she mashes up. She's got some uh, roasted and salted pistachios that she chops up. She's got vanilla extract and almond extract. I might just do the vanilla, keep it simple. And then eight ounces of bittersweet chocolate, uh, 70%. She just has it right on her website, 70% or higher. Uh, she uses the chocolate chips. And then she's got some sugar in there, a little bit of butter and some eggs. And she's making this most luscious, yummy banana chocolate bread, chocolate banana bread. She calls it a dessert bread. Oh my gosh. That's another recipe. I'm totally going to try this. And then the last one, this is just little teasers because um, in the roundup, you know, I have almost 40 recipes. This is a recipe here from another dietitian named Kelly Jones. And she's got these easy vegan turtles. Hmm. And in this recipe, no sugar added. She's using dates. Okay. A pound of soft medjool dates pitted, a little bit of salt, She's got pecans or walnuts in here. She's got 85% dark chocolate chips. Mm -mm -mm. And because they're vegan, she's going dairy-free and she's got some cayenne pepper, which is optional. So she's pulsing these dates in a food processor. Sometimes what I like to do with dates is I'll chop them up first. And if they're really hard, I might soak them in warm water for like 10 minutes and then drain them really well but she's pulverizing them in a food processor and it'll, it'll kind of all like get, it'll develop like a ball. It'll look like almost, you know, kind of thick, right? But everything's pulverized. And then she will, let's see, she's adding, oh, she's melting her chocolate. And once melted here, let's, what does she do? Once melted, she's scooping a half to a tablespoon worth of the dates to form somewhat of a ball and she's pressing a walnut into the top of this ball. She's putting on wax paper on top of like a baking cookie sheet. She's then dipping this, let's see, dip into, cho- oh, she's taking this, this little ball of dates and, and the walnut. She's dipping into the melted dark chocolate. She's coating the entire date mixture. And then she's putting this blob, this is another blob recipe on wax paper, and she's refrigerating just five to 10 minutes before serving. So it's this ball of dates with the nut, and then she's just covering completely in this dark chocolate. Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm looking at this recipe. And I'm just like, I love chocolate. I love it too much. I absolutely adore it. So, <laughs> so please give some of these recipes a try and let me know what you think of them. We need to treat ourselves, right? All right. Let me just wrap things up by telling you the difference between like cocoa powder and dark chocolate and milk chocolate and all that good stuff. So cocoa powder, we know we use it for cakes and brownies and garnishes. And, you know, we use it in baking all the time. Cocoa powder should be unsweetened. And if it's not, if it is not unsweetened, it is hot chocolate mix, right? So we know we need it for brownies and we use it instead of flour sometimes to to even coat pans when we're baking. But cocoa powder, that's like a, a bit of a workhorse in my kitchen. I use it like if I'm making date balls. You know, I was just telling you about Kelly's recipe for the turtles, but I'll take like dates and I'll put them in a food processor with cocoa powder and I'll add a little maple syrup and I'll add some almond butter. I may, and then I just pulverize it and I chill it for a little bit and I roll them into these balls and then I coat it in cocoa powder or sometimes toasted coconut. And those are like so sweet and, but naturally sweet, mostly, you know, from the dates and a little bit of sweetness from the maple syrup. But anyway, cocoa powder, Workhorse in my kitchen, it is unsweetened. Now, dark chocolate is for true chocolate aficionados. That's got a cacao content in the 70% or higher range. And for some people, dark chocolate can be a little bit bitter. For me, the darker, the better. I like that almost bitter flavor. I love just getting those like beautiful flavors of just the true cacao, the true chocolate flavor. 
So dark is 70% or higher. Bittersweet, often used interchangeably with dark, bittersweet hovers at 70%. So you got 70% bittersweet. Dark chocolate, 70% or higher. What about semi-sweet? Semi-sweet hovers around 60%. So sometimes people will use bittersweet or semi-sweet kind of at the same time, right? You know, it's frequently like semi-sweet, frequently found in like baking chips and bars in block form. It's a great kind of all-purpose option. But for me, I'm going for bittersweet or I'm going for dark. Now, what about unsweetened chocolate? is best for melting into other ingredients like butter and cream because the consistency of the chocolate can be a little bit chalky. So you need to kind of smooth it out. So that's why it's sometimes called for in recipes, but it'll be added to other, you know, creamier things. But unsweetened is like, you know, if you've ever bitten into unsweetened chocolate, that's pretty bitter, right? Now, what about milk chocolate? Well, milk chocolate is sweeter. It's less bitter, certainly, than dark chocolate. It's got lots of milk solids added. It's got sugar added. It has 10 to 50% cocoa solids. And you know, sometimes when you get chocolate, especially milk chocolate, and you bite into it and you're like, this just has no flavor. This tastes kind of waxy to me. Well, you just keep eating it because you're like, it's got to taste better. It's got to taste better. So that's why I, t- I don't even like milk chocolate because because I don't love it, I feel like I'll eat more of it because I'm looking for that chocolate flavor. And you're really not going to get it because you've got lots of sugar and milk solids added to it. What about white chocolate? Well, there's no cacao in white chocolate. It's just cocoa butter, which is one of the byproducts of the processing of the cacao bean, cocoa butter and sugar. And it can have a very polarizing flavor. Some people love it. Some people do not like it at all. I am in the, I do not like it at all camp. So no cacao at all in white chocolate, but again, some cocoa butter and sugar. So it's, you know, it is derived from the cacao tree. So I know this might've been a surprising episode for you guys. My last episode was on, uh, let's see, chickpeas from my longevity kitchen. My next episode is going to be on kale and collard greens, but I think dark chocolate deserved a place in the longevity kitchen episode. And that's because, you know, as we strive to eat a healthy plant-based diet with small amounts of all of our favorite foods, dark chocolate has a place. It's a plant food. It can help to feed the good bacteria in our gut. It's a prebiotic it can help to lower our risk of heart disease. It can help to boost our mood. Like who is not happy when they're eating a little bit of dark chocolate? It is good for brain health. And so adding just a little bit can really go a long way towards making our longevity diets taste even better and make them even more enjoyable. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like the show, tell a friend about it, post a review on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out the show notes from today's show, packed with all sorts of delicious recipe ideas. And as always, thanks for listening to Eat, Drink, Live Longer. Mm -hmm.